Now, Patrick Henningsen of uh, the 21st Century Wire is a global analyst, a TV and radio broadcaster, a writer, a man of note and a good friend of the show. He's been here before and it's always interesting to hear what he's got to say, not least because he attended a very interesting meeting in the Houses of Parliament this week and he's here to tell us about it. Patrick, welcome back uh, to the show. This is the Duma affair which, as I said earlier, almost brought the world to war and is now widely regarded as having been based uh, entirely on a hoax. Uh, that I don't know which is more surprising, uh, that this hoax uh, was perpetrated or that the media have conspired entirely to suppress the evidence that proves it to be a hoax. How about you? Well, the, last week was a big week. Two, two important things happened. The first was a UN Security Council uh, meeting on this very subject uh, that featured one of the whistleblowers from the OPCW. His name is Ian Henderson. He was on the ground team that investigated initially with Duma. And uh, that was in the ARIA format, so it was an informal meeting because obviously the, uh, not all of the members wanted this to happen, uh, but Russia was one of the countries pushing for it. And it was uh, stunning, and I, I might add that, you know, these whistleblowers are being attacked. They're being attacked in the press. They're being attacked by uh, political figures. They're being attacked by uh, organizations like Bellingcat. So that was on Monday. And then on Wednesday, there was a meeting in the Houses of Parliament, uh, the House of Commons uh, room. This was booked by a Labour MP, uh, who I believe is the uh, shadow minister for defense, Fabian Hamilton. And uh, he wanted to uh, allow uh, people to air uh, the evidence right now. And that was presented by the working group. Good for him. That, that took quite some courage to do that. Yeah, so uh, he, he, he believed that uh, the, uh, inter the leaked report should get a fair hearing. Uh, so that was presented. There were military figures there, former head of the SAS, uh, uh, retired Major General John Holmes. Uh, he chaired the meeting, actually. Uh, there were lords there, a few MPs, uh, mainstream press, and a few activists as well. So what uh, the findings of this, the presentation was stunning, okay? And what it, what it proved beyond any doubt is that the executive at the OPCW intervened uh, between the interim report and the final report to alter, radically alter the findings and conclusions of the ground investigation team. That includes manipulation of data, uh, expunging expert opinion, analysis, to give a very different conclusion, to give the conclusion in the final report that chlorine was used, that there was a chemical attack featuring chlorine. Sarin had already been ruled out because it just wasn't present but there was still this uh, hanging issue of chlorine. Now, after seeing this presentation and the evidence from the whistleblowers, it's clear that there was no chlorine attack by any honest evaluation of this. Now, the problem is uh, the, uh, UN, the UN has put together the OPCW under a charter of neutrality. That was violated as well. US agents, unknown. Uh, putting direct pressure inside the offices of the OPCW. So uh, this is a, you're probably familiar with this, George, with uh, uh, UN SCOM and UN MOVIC, how the United States effectively destroyed. They colonized the supposedly United Nations neutral uh, practical uh, organizations, turned them into ideological weapons. And destroyed them at the end of the day. Indeed. Rendered them uh, useless, really, for the, uh, the mission that they initially had. This is exactly what's happening to the OPCW right now, and this is what has happened. The, the takeaway of this that's really important is that there's two war crimes were committed. The, the, the U.S., France, the, uh, the U.K. launched an airstrike based on intelligence they claimed they had, which clearly wasn't there. They did so to preempt an investigation. By, by striking before uh, any investigation could be done. That automatically puts political pressure on the actual process of investigating before it even happens. As well as contaminating the site. As, as well. And, and so this is a, a, a compounded problem. That, so there's the striking uh, another UN member state uh, in an undeclared act of aggression. That's a war crime. Then you have what staging of dead bodies. This is something that was flagged up by the ground investigation team. This is, this is a serious war crime. We're talking about between 30 and 40 uh, um, uh, victims. Yeah, in this. so who killed them? This is an unanswered question. And so we have a situation where a, a body like the OPCW goes in 
and according to the executive, how they sanitize this report, they don't offer uh, any, uh, uh, any inquiry into any alternative hypothesis other than there was a chemical weapon attack that took place, when in fact there's a number of other possibilities, more likely possibilities, that the terrorists who occupied Duma at the time uh, have uh, staged. The ev there is evidence of staging there that canisters were placed in position and not dropped. Well, I've seen a picture of uh, one of these canisters uh, that Ian Henderson, a British uh, engineer, a technician of unimpeachable credentials, says uh, was neither fired as a projectile nor dropped from an aircraft. It had been laid there to be photographed and to spill its uh, potentially deadly content. How devastating is that? It's incredible. That's this is a piece of information from a man with no axe to grind, no motive, no ulterior motive at all, except getting his motive is getting the truth out. And it's been completely blacked out of the mainstream British media. That's the, you made an important point, George. These are multiple whistleblowers. Normally you have one whistleblower who comes public, and that's a big uh, event, that's a big scandal. We have multiple whistleblowers, so clearly there's no political motivation here. This is purely on ethical and professional whistleblowing basis. And I'm, I might add that Jonathan Steele, who is a veteran journalist of uh, high regard, a uh, former Middle East correspondent for The Guardian, he also attended and presented at this meeting at the House of Commons, and he made some very strong remarks regarding the press's handling of this, or should I say, uh, media blackout of this. And uh, he submitted pieces on this to mainstream publications, and uh, I'm paraphrasing him, but he also has said this publicly, that uh, he was turned down by a number of publications because they didn't want to advance the Russian or Syrian position <laughs> on the issue. So where are we in terms of... Uh, our well, you're a journalist, you tell me. I mean, how does this work? Uh, are journalists threatened? Are they bribed? How are they twisted into, I mean, especially British, the British media. Here we have a British scientist like Dr. David Kelly saying something, not like Dr. Kelly, God rest his soul, uh, privately and off the record, but publicly, in Ian Henderson's case, publicly saying, you've been fed a crock and it almost caused a major war. How is that not a story in British uh, media? Even better than that, his findings were ordered to be purged from the OPCW's internal archive. That, by definition, is a cover-up. No question about it. So from a journalist, how much of a scent do you need for a story? You've got the cover-up. You've got war crimes. Uh, you've got whistleblowers who are being uh, demonized. Who speak English and they're British <laughs> and they're here. <laughs> you know that old famous old book, anyone, anyone around here being raped and speaks English? Uh, that was uh, uh, um, uh, meant to be a satire on how actually Western journalists were only interested if you could speak English. And uh, if uh, the crime that had been committed was uh, fit to lead the front page. Here you have a story with everything that has been systematically, uh, not just ignored, as you say, but expunged. Um, maybe it's the chilling effect of what happened to our friend, Julian Assange. He blew the whistle, and look where he is now. That's the intention of the treatment of Julian, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, any time you have evidence of war crimes or exculpatory evidence that could have exonerated, for instance, the Syrian government, in these chemical attack in Duma in April of 2018. But that's not any different than the type of stuff that WikiLeaks made public on multiple occasions uh, that are you know, war crimes that are definitely in the public interest. To bury exculpatory evidence and then launch a war based on a, a false premise of uh, guilt, uh, a, a false pretext of intelligence that's not there. Again, this is no different, I think, than Iraq. It's a very different configuration of events, but effectively it's the same process. Patrick, let me take a quick break. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at sputniknews.com. 
Tune in every Thursday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for the regular segment called Veterans for Peace, where we focus on the contemporary issues of war and peace that affect veterans, their families, the country, and the world as a whole. Veterans for Peace President Jerry Condon joins the show every Thursday. Hear about this and more every Thursday right here on Radio Sputnik. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom, and you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Now, uh, it's a red-letter day when the hardened convicts of Belmarsh Prison uh, have got a better idea of justice than the British judicial authorities. Yet they have played a decisive role in springing Julian Assange, at least from the horrors of uh, solitary confinement. That must have gladdened your heart. Yeah, this, this was something, um, this was a combination of an effort uh, led by his fellow inmates, uh, but also by the campaigners and uh, Julian Assange's defense team uh, to take him out of what is effectively unofficial unofficial solitary confinement. And if you look closer at the prison regulations and the actual, uh, what governs Her Majesty's prisons, you'll see that the, there is, uh, they deny that they do solitary confinement, but in effect, Julian Assange has been confined for over 22 hours a day. That by definition, by all international standards, is solitary confinement. They're able to do that through a kind of bureaucratic fiat by making unofficially, he was you know, held in uh, the health a unit, a Belmarsh. Now, uh, so it's not officially sanctioned as solitary on paper. And by doing that, they've been able to kind of do a runaround on sort of accountability of what the expectations are for a prisoner being held in those types of conditions. It's a very uh, uh, complicated maze of um, regulations and bureaucracy, but we have actually uh, done a nice analysis of this, which is up on 21st Century Wire right now. I'll read that. Um, but of course, the impact of the unofficial solitary confinement is compounded by, I mean, okay, Julian's been late or not turned up for his court dates because the prison didn't deliver him uh, to the court. Uh, he has had an absurdly limited amount of time with his lawyers when he's facing the trial of the century. Uh, his lawyers, instead of being, as in any logical uh, process, allowed to spend all day, every day with him preparing his case, have been uh, restricted to a ridiculous, uh, ridiculously suppressed amount of access to the, to the prisoner. Um, is that now likely to change? I see that the uh, hearing has been postponed by a month. Are we beginning glacially to see uh, a change, do you think, in the attitude to Julian? I'll tell you why I ask. The U.S. has just refused to extradite the wife of a U.S. intelligence officer to Britain uh, to answer uh, to the uh, accusation that she killed through negligence uh, a young English boy, a cyclist. The U.S. has just, by fiat, denied this uh, extradition, while we are being asked to send Julian Assange in the other direction. Do you see, as I do, maybe the beginning of a window in which Julian can escape this dreaded fate? It depends how much uh, people in this country uh, are outraged uh, by this uh, person claiming diplomatic immunity, which, by the way, if you look at the whole reason for diplomatic immunity in history... She doesn't have. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't meant for these types of... Of situations, but uh, back to to Julian Assange, um, it, the, the effort to get him released is constantly going on behind the scenes, uh, and so he is uncharged, he is unconvicted, he's being held as a in, in a Category A fashion, even though he's not a Category A prisoner. Uh, so, in, if you compare contrast his treatment to Tommy Robinson, who was in Belmarsh uh, just a few months ago, was given pretty much unlimited visitation. Uh, it was unlimited use of the telephone, according to reports, between uh, you know, 9 and 11 every morning. Uh, and you, you compare that to Julian Assange, as you rightly said, this is the most important case in freedom of the press in the early 21st century. This has global implications for every single journalist, media outlet, not just that, but just the right of 
uh, to be able to have a free press in whatever country you're in. The United States is not going to come and render your journalist and then take him to the U.S. And according to WikiLeaks uh, editor Christian Harferson, he said he's looked at the documentation uh, that, uh, from, the, from the legal team and said that the United States is attempting to strip Julian Assange of any First Amendment protections when he arrives in the U.S. So imagine that going to render a journalist from another country, bring him for a trial in the United States on the mainland, not, not Guantanamo Bay, on the mainland, and then say that you no longer have First Amendment protections. And not only that, your legal team is not allowed to be able to speak to the uh, media. So there's uh, special administrative uh, measures, they call it, uh, media blackout. So that's treating him like a Gitmo, black hooded you know, terrorist in a orange jumpsuit. Extraordinary offshore. rendition. Extraordinary rendition. So this is a total abrogation of the First Amendment. Uh, and so this is happening under this president, under this administration. Meanwhile, they're impeaching, they're trying to impeach the president for what doesn't uh, uh, rise for to... For a phone call to the Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, to hold up an arms, uh, an arms shipment to, uh, to the Ukraine. So, and, and this is a real crisis, potentially uh, a very dangerous precedent indeed. And um, uh, where is America? Where are the Democrats? Where are the Republicans? Where are the Constitutionalists, the Libertarians, the Paleoconservatives? Where are they? Well, and, and look at Chelsea Manning, $1,000 a day fine, not allowed out to attend her mother's funeral, uh, having already served her time, now being behind bars for refusing to testify in front of a grand jury against Julian Assange. What a mess this all is. Where are the feminists? Where are the trans rights campaigners? Why aren't they out fighting for Chelsea Manning? Why aren't the free speech brigade, the libertarians, the, the leftists, the liberals, where are they? How come it's only thee and me standing outside <laughs> Belmarsh with a handful of others? Yeah, in America, well, there are good people. I think the American Civil Liberties Union and uh, there's very good legal uh, people that are lining up to uh, tackle this case, but I'm talking about a handful of people, but a very dedicated handful of people very. that could that could uh, draw more support, and it, this could become a bigger issue. The problem is, George, I, I am left to ask the question of do how much do people really care about their rights? Um, is is the is the impetus for this so far in the rearview mirror of uh, civilization in the 21st century that it no longer is a priority to? to basically stand on the front line when, in fact, this is the moment, this is the watershed moment where you're looking at it. It's like the life of Brian when they, mm -hmm. uh, they're meeting and they, and they come in and say, Reg, it's happening, it's really happening. And they <laughs> say, oh, you know, not, not now, we're busy, you know, we're talking. Well, but, always look on the bright side of life, as the song says, there's an election coming up. Will that change anything on the Assange case? Will Trump, if he's re-elected, uh, take steps to stop this because he actually used uh, WikiLeaks and Julian. Uh, he quoted their stuff innumerable times in his denunciation of the Iraq war and so on. Uh, if he's re-elected, will he stop this? And if he's not re-elected and Bernie Sanders is elected or Joe Biden or Elizabeth Warren, will they stop it? This is a good question. This is easy. This is easy leverage if you want to take Donald Trump to task on an important issue and hit the conservatives in the heart because they normally uh, bandy about the Constitution, uh, the conservatives and Republicans. So will they do that? And this is the question is, you know, what is the uh, allegiance, blind allegiance to the five eyes, to the security state? This is a bipartisan problem in Washington. The strongest voices are Rand Paul, or Tulsi Gabbard, she's being absolutely uh, buried by the media in her presidential run. Clearly, she has uh, taken a very clear position on this case. She's the only one who is demanding uh, the Assange case be dropped. But Bernie Sanders has as well, but it's not. It, it, this requires some leadership and a little bit of energy uh, to really take, take Donald Trump to task on this. And it's an easy knockout punch. But the question is, will they do it? And if they don't, that really says a lot about the state of politics right now. In the United States because the First Amendment, every other right in the Bill of Rights is built on top of that. So if that's uh, compromised in any way. But what about my first point? If Trump is re-elected, might he do something? Might he pardon Julian, for example? That would be fantastic if he did. So maybe the pressure would be off with re-election, not having to, you know, toe, toe the line with the neoconservatives, for instance, 
show a little bit of independence, have a legacy as a somebody who's done something as a to defend the Constitution, a defender of freedom, a real defender of freedom. Mm. That's a good question, George. I really hope so. Uh, I really hope so. But it's not looking very good at the moment. Uh, what what will it take? Will it take egg on the face of the Department of Justice? Will it take a Supreme Court ruling? But how long will that take? How many years? What will happen to Julian Assange in the meantime? Or Chelsea Manning, for instance, who's uh, being extraordinary. You know, yeah. Patrick, it's always a pleasure even to discuss somber issues with you. Patrick Henningsing, 21st Century Wire. I must read. I read it every day.